Hi, welcome to our um, second webinar for Reinforced Concrete Pipe. Today we're going to be talking about RCP 101 and some of the basics um, we use in designing and installing our product. Um, we'll give everybody just a couple minutes to hop on this call. And while we're giving those everyone a few minutes, you should be able to see a dashboard for the webinar. Um, everyone is in listen-only mode. It helps keep the noise down for this call. Um, but there is a question panel. So if you open that up, you should be able to type questions, any questions you have throughout the presentation. We'll allow our presenters to go through their presentation first, and then we'll get to as many questions as we can at the end of it. Uh, last time we had some great questions, so feel free to type those in as we go along. We also have um, videos we'll be showing, and those videos do play through your computer. So if there is sound in these videos, um, you'll need to turn your sound on on your computer to hear that. And finally, we will have some poll questions um, for you throughout the presentation. If you can answer those for us, that helps us know that you were attentive and providing PDHs. And speaking of PDHs, we will provide those to all those who are in attendance. Those do get based on who is logged in to the webinar. So if you are on the phone with a group of folks, if you'll just send me an email, um, my email address, I don't think it's on the screen, is K Spawn, just like my name show there, Kim Spawn, K Spawn at concretepipe.org. And if you'll let me know the person's um, first name, last name, and PE number, we are adding those um, to the PDH certificate. So to be respectful of everyone's time, we'll go ahead and get started. I'd like to, like to introduce our presenters. Um, we have Felix Lopez. He's the general manager for Rinker Materials in El Paso, Texas. We also have uh, Trig Hoff. He is the ACPA Northeast Region Engineer. Um, so Felix, I'll go ahead and turn the presentation over to you. Thanks, Kim. All right, well, we'll get right into the meat of things, and we'll start pretty basic here, but let's start by defining storm drain. So in its most basic definition, uh, it is a system that conveys excess water to basins or lakes. In nature, we see these as arroyos or rivers that stream to ponds or lakes, such as uh, that beautiful scenery there. Uh, in developed areas, however, this storm runoff uh, must be designed and controlled. Now, this can be done in two basic ways. The first is using sloped streets as uh, watersheds, such as the image you see there. Not the fanciest of design by all means, but uh, something pretty common in, in uh, some residential areas. The second is the use of buried infrastructure. In this webinar, we'll go over the buried pipe basics uh, and specifically a little bit more in depth on uh, reinforced concrete pipe. So a buried pipeline performs two basic but very important functions. Since it is underground, it must now be a structure with strength capable of withstanding the loads above it. Second, it must be a conduit to convey the storm runoff. The structural strength of this uh, system is composed of the strength of the pipe itself and the strength of the soil around it, often called the soil envelope. For the system to be a proper conduit, it must have secure and properly performing joints, um, as well as you know, proper alignment of uh, the pipe, that, that's obviously a huge, uh, plays a big role in the joint performance as well. So within buried pipeline, there are two basic uh, uh, types that we'll go over. That would be rigid, such as the ones that uh, use reinforced concrete pipe, and flexible, which are ones that use uh, other type of materials such as uh, a flexible plastic such as uh, HDPE or polypropylene, uh, thin metals, um, corrugated metal pipe, 
uh, is, is a common one. Um, so it is very important to note that these systems are quite different and therefore not interchangeable. So how are they different? Well, for that, we will hit the chalkboard a little bit. So let's first take a look at a rigid systems pipe and soil interaction. Here we have our trench cross section. And if you look at the two strength components of the system, the pipe and the soil, the soil will contribute a small portion of the strength while the pipe being a rigid structure contributes the majority. Now looking at a cross section of the rigid pipe, when subject to a load, the pipe accepts the load and then effectively transfers it to the foundation. So in this type of system, the pipe plays a major role in the total strength, much more so than the backfill around it. Now, if we look at a flexible system, uh, in this type of system, the roles of the pipe and the soil are completely the opposite. So if we look at this backfill in this arrangement, the soil must be the rigid component because the pipe is by definition flexible. Looking at a cross section of the flexible pipe, when subject to a load, the pipe will naturally want to deflect into an oval shape. To prevent this from happening, uh, where the pipe could fail, uh, the backfill must provide the side support. So this soil structure is of major importance and is constructed in the field by the contractors. Uh, this is done by mechanically compacting the backfill, uh, typically to much higher density levels than needed uh, for a, a typical rigid system. So in a flexible pipe system, the backfill is what provides the majority of the total strength while the pipe is acting as a liner that helps distribute the, the load to the soil envelope. So the one major similarity with both systems is that they both must provide a reliable structure. With the major difference that we just discussed, you know, a logical question would be how are these key differences accounted for? Uh, and the answer is that, you know, within a rigid system, the engineer is selecting or designing the pipe strength, while in a flexible system, the engineer would design the soil envelope. So for those reasons that we just went over, um, this slide shows us uh, concrete and plastic pipe uh, installation details. They are quite different, as you can see um, on the slide here. On the left, we can see a typical installation for a, a rigid system. It shows you the basic terminology, and in the pink shaded area, it shows the critical area for insulation for this type of system. This area goes from the foundation uh, to the spring line of the pipe, and spring line is um, just a term to denote that in circular pipe, it's the midway point of the cross section. If it's not circular, just think about it as the widest point of the pipe such as arch or elliptical pipe. Now, this doesn't mean that anything above this area isn't important, but it just illustrates that in a rigid system, this is the most critical part when it comes to installation. In a flexible system, the critical area is twice as large as you can see on the detail on the right, uh, typically going one foot above the pipe. Why is this, uh, why is this so, why is that? this different? Well, as we previously mentioned, this is the structure of the system. So a couple of major differences to point out is that since the backfill is the most critical part in a flexible system, uh, this backfill is typically an engineered backfill and it must be imported to the job site. Um, and since the size of the critical area is twice as large, it logically means uh, much more imported material. The next key difference is that now we're relying on the contractor to build the structure on site uh, versus in a rigid system where the structure is manufactured uh, in a much more controlled environment, typically uh, a manufacturing plant. So uh, another logical question uh, after learning about the structural importance of buried infrastructure is how is pipe structural integrity measured? 
Well, for reinforced concrete pipe, we have a test called the deload test. Um, this test uh, loads the pipe via a hydraulic beam, um, and we're typically, uh, not typically, we're definitely uh, wanting to capture two critical points. The first one is uh, where this pipe will develop an, a 0 0.01 inch crack, and the second one is loading it to, a, to ultimate. So the load is measured at each of these points and then recorded. Uh, the beautiful thing about this test is that it is a true test of finished pipe. It's not a calculated or theoretical value. Uh, it is a real-life test that gives us real results, and engineers can design to this O1 design strength because manufacturers are held responsible to these strength standards. Uh, it is, in fact, a true measure of the load the pipe can withstand. Um, so the resulting value is expressed in pounds force per linear foot, per foot diameter, as you can see under the picture. Uh, and we'll get into what this value is and what, what it uh, truly means a little further on. For a flexible pipe, the available test is called the parallel plate test. As you can see from the picture on the right, the test piece is placed between two plates and subject to a load. The load is applied until the pipe is deflected a certain percentage from round uh, and then this result is recorded and expressed in pounds force per inch deflection per inch length. Uh, so now knowing what we know about a flexible system strength, uh, we can tell that this value isn't particularly helpful in trying to determine how much load the pipe will be able to withstand once installed because it's, it's the soil that provides the strength in the system. So, you know, just to kind of recap a little bit on, on those two uh, major differences. With RCP, the deload strength is a load crushing strength test and it directly relates those results to actual loads uh, that the buried infrastructure or the buried pipe can withstand what's, once it's installed. In the flexible uh, system, the pipe stiffness value um, is a value that relates the pipe's effectiveness in resisting handling and, uh, and installation, but it is not a measure of strength, and it does not let you know how much the load can withstand once it is installed. So this is a, a key difference that we want to uh, emphasize. So we've talked a little bit about uh, pipe strength, and um, I'll hand it over to um, my partner, Trig, so he can talk to us a little bit more about RCP strength. Great, thanks, Felix. So uh, let's talk about proving that reinforced concrete pipe strength that Felix has just described. So ASTM C76 is kind of our recipe book, and it gives us the option of five different strength classes of pipe that we can build using the ingredients given in that recipe book. So with a class five pipe, that would be our strongest pipe. You can see our D load for class five is 3,000 pounds per foot per foot. And then each subsequent class has a slightly lower D load. Now let's look at how the span of a pipe might impact those loads that are experienced by the structure. So at the diagram above, if we look at say a 12 inch diameter pipe under a specific depth of cover, we'd expect that pipe to experience approximately the dead load of a soil column, the same width of that pipe. That makes sense. If we expanded the diameter of the pipe to say 36 inches, then you would probably expect, you know, approximately that the load on that pipe would increase three times as well, as well as the diameter did. So this is just sort of intuitive. Just looking at this diagram, you increase your span, you increase your load because it's supporting that much more dead load. So with that in mind, uh, let's check out the chart on the right side here. Uh, this chart is an example of class four reinforced concrete pipe. So that's a D load, a D service load of 2,000 pounds per foot per foot, an ultimate of 3,000 pounds per foot per foot. Uh, looking at that service load of 2,000, uh, if we look at the 12 inch pipe and then we compare that to the 36 inch pipe, the strength of that pipe increases by three, three times. Uh, so 16,000 pounds is one third as strong as 48,000 pounds. And that's true all the way down through this chart. So if we take the 12 inch pipe and we compare it to a 12 foot diameter pipe, that 144 inch pipe at 192,000 pounds of strength is 12 times stronger than the 12 inch pipe. 
So now let's, uh, let's look at how we come to these strength values. So still talking about that 48 inch class four pipe. Um, we would take our D service load of 2000 pounds per foot per foot and the D ultimate load of 3000 pounds. And we convert those, those uh, D loads um, as they are applied to this pipe. So with the service load, we convert 48 inches to feet. So 48 divided by 12, multiply that by an eight foot length, which is our standard pipe length and then multiply that by the service load of that 2,000 pounds per foot per foot. Uh, if you follow all those units and multiply that out, that gives us 64,000 pounds. So that pipe has to withstand 64,000 pounds on the deload test, the three edge bearing test that uh, Felix mentioned earlier, before it reaches our service limit of a hundredth of an inch crack. The same thing is true math wise with the ultimate test that works out to, uh, ultimate loading works out to 96,000 pounds. So those are some big numbers. So maybe we can relate them to some more common items you might see on a regular basis. For example, uh, to reach that ultimate load of 96,000 pounds, we would need to stack a little more than 10 and a half Ford F-250 extended cabs with the four by four option on top of the pipe. Or if we had access to uh, four and a half of the Guinness Book of World Records largest African elephant on record, uh, we could also meet that ultimate load. Uh, or perhaps we'd stack 1.2 of a Cat 966 with a bucket fully loaded of 57 stone uh, to also achieve that ultimate load. And remember, we're not saying place this on a pipe that's in the ground that has the benefit of support of the soils around it. We're saying apply a line load with 1.2 Cat 966s with a bucket full on top of that pipe. Um, these, these are all, we're talking three edge bearing tests. So here's an example. This is a... a um, a 3D example of the three edge bearing rack that we use to test that D load capacity. And as you might imagine, three edge bearing means that it has three edges of loading that are applied to the, to the pipe. We have two strips of hard rubber or wood underneath the pipe and that helps to balance it so it doesn't roll off of the rack. And then one strip across the top which applies the load from above. So as I, as I mentioned, uh, this is the most severe loading situation the pipe's going to experience. It doesn't have the benefit of any soil support around it. So in this case, we are at zero soil support when we load this pipe. So we, when we load it, we're looking for certain cracks. And Kim, I think it's time for our first poll. Uh, and we'd like to know where you, you as the audience, uh, thinks this pipe is going to crack first as we load it up. Great. Thanks, Greg. So you'll see on your screen there, and everybody should be able to answer right there on their screen. Where do you think the pipe will crack when it's loaded? Uh, answers are A, completely random location. B, circumferentially around the pipe. C, longitudinally in the tension zone. Or D, at the bell and spigot end. So if you guys will take a minute there and answer this poll. All right, so I'm going to close that. You can see the answers here in just a second. Okay, so um, Trig and Felix, we had 0% say that it was random, which is good news. Circumferentially was 9%, 85% thought longitudinally, and 6% thought at the bell and spigot end. Excellent. Well, thanks, Kim. Uh, so several of you, uh, more than 80%, got that correct. And we had a, a few folks that said circumferential cracks. And by circumferential cracks, we mean a crack that runs around the outside wall of the pipe. And if you take a closer look at the three edge bearing rack, um, the way those loads are oriented, it's actually trying to crack the pipe um, perpendicular to the span. Uh, so we would, ex we would expect those longitudinal cracks in this situation. So the diagram on the right side, you can see we've colored this, uh, the section view of the pipe on the rack. Um, the blue zones are compression, the red zones are tension. And as we all know, concrete is, is great in compression. It's one tenth or about 10% as strong in tension as it is in compression. And so that's the main reason we have reinforced concrete pipe is because 
that reinforcing steel helps take on the load in the tension zones. So we expect that pipe when we load it on this on the three edge bearing rack, and as well as when it's loaded in the ground, we expect it to, and certainly design it to, crack in those tension or in those red zones that we're showing on the diagram. So let's, let's shift gears slightly, um, and let's look at how that strength is built into reinforced concrete pipe. So first, as we've, we've already mentioned the reinforcing cages, uh, so these are usually built are always built on site at the plant uh, for each specific class of pipe. Uh, the cages are then set on a bottom pallet, which forms the interior of the bell, uh, and then the outer jacket closes around the cage. Then this pipe is, is produced either through the vibratory process or through the packer head process, and we'll talk about both of those in a second. Uh, and then finally, the photo on the far right side, uh, the pipe is finished by placing it in a kiln overnight to achieve that maximum strength in as short a period of time as we can while helping to minimize shrinkage cracks. So most plants in our industry are going to utilize a steam kiln for this process. Now all concrete, and, and I'm, I'm sure I'm preaching to the choir here with everyone on the phone call, as, as civil engineers, we all take concrete classes in college. So this, I apologize for, for you know, uh, getting really down to the basics, but all concrete is made of some basic ingredients and, and all of those ingredients are found in ASTM C76, again, that recipe book for concrete pipe. So we use water, cement, sand, aggregate, reinforcing steel, and, and additional cementitious materials, which can help to increase the durability of the concrete. Uh, in many cases, these additional cementitious materials are, are actually waste products from other industries. So you we, we can add fly ash from coal-fired power plants, uh, blast furnace slag from steel production, or silica fume from the production of silicon alloy. And that incorporation of those materials into the mix helps to conserve natural resources. We're not using as much cement, um, and it reduces the overall energy needed to produce the concrete. Now, when we're producing concrete pipe, there's two basic methods, or, or two basic mixes that can be utilized. So we could do a wet mix or a dry mix. Uh, wet cast concrete is the type of concrete that, that we're all familiar with. We drive on it every day, we walk on it on the sidewalks. Your typical slabs are wet mix concrete. Um, and the water cement ratios from a wet mix to a dry mix are significantly different. Uh, with a dry mix, the slump values are around zero or they could even be negative. And, and what do I mean by negative slump? I'm not saying that as you pull the cone off, the, the concrete slumps up. It, uh, it, doesn't, it doesn't grow. Uh, but when we remove that cone, we could add more water to the mix and it would stay at zero. That's what I mean by a negative slump. Um, the initial set with dry mix concrete is very fast. It can be achieved in less than an hour, uh, which allows us to reuse our forms frequently throughout the day, which, which increases productivity, brings down price of our product. With dry cast, we have two basic options. We can, uh, we can utilize the vibratory method or the packer head method. And we'll discuss each of these methods, but first I wanna, I wanna show you guys a video of a couple of pieces of freshly cast concrete pipe. I, I just took this video a couple of weeks ago at one of our plant tours. Uh, the concrete in these pipes was just placed in the forms a few seconds before this video starts. And the jackets are then immediately removed and uh, the pipe is, is already able to support its own weight. So let's check out the video. This is a Mastermatic uh, vibratory machine. So you can see the outer jackets were just lifted up. The pipe is standing on its own. And in fact, it's not only standing on its own, it's able to be lifted and moved around the plant uh, and, and is completely stable. Um, certainly, those of us familiar with wet cast concrete, you would never, you would never expect to be able to see that. Uh, so it's, it's a pretty neat aspect of dry cast, precast products. Okay, and as soon as we get our webinar, okay, there we go. All right, so let's look at uh, the packer head machine for casting pipe. Uh, this is slightly different than the vibratory process that was just illustrated. Uh, the, 
The packer head also uses that dry, uh, dry mix concrete and it is actually fed into the outer forms which shape the exterior of the pipe. The interior of the pipe is then formed by a rapidly spinning mechanism called a roller head and that is raised up through the center of the pipe and that roller head consolidates and compacts the dry mix into the pipe walls um, and then those forms can be stripped immediately. If we take a closer look at the vibratory process, again, we're using that zero slump dry mix concrete, uh, but rather than a rotating roller head inside the pipe, uh, inside the forms that create the inner wall, we're actually using a vibrating inner core and that helps to consolidate the concrete. Um, the vibrators within the inner core and also on the outside of the jacket provide the exact energy needed to liquefy the mix, which allows concrete to consolidate. Now, I know when I say liquefy, a dry mix of concrete that sounds crazy, but we have a video to illustrate that um, that we'll jump to next. So this video is from a plant tour uh, out of Indiana where a vibratory Hawkeye equipment was being used. Uh, this concrete had already been consolidated and you can see On my end, that video froze up a little bit. So I hope you guys all got to see that. If you didn't uh, um, get a hold of myself or Felix, and we'd be happy to share that video with you. The reason I call it the sword in the stone video, the idea is you can't get the rebar into that, into that consolidated mix because it is packed in there so tightly. Uh, but as soon as you turn those vibrators on, it, it does actually liquefy, the rebar falls into it. If you turn the vibrators back off, you cannot pull that rebar back out. Uh, the concrete is consolidated around the rebar and it is it's stuck in that position until you turn the rebar, I'm sorry, until you turn the, uh, the vibrators back on. So with that, I'm going to pass this back to Felix uh, and he's going to talk a little bit about concrete pipe design. All right. Thank you, Trig. Uh, well, so now that we've uh, discussed some of the strength and some of the key differences with flexible and, and uh, rigid, uh, looking at RCP design, how, how is it designed? Well, uh, as a designer, you would have two options for designing or selecting the concrete pipe strength. Um, we'll get into why I said selecting uh, in a little bit. The first is called the direct design method. In this method, you would determine the loads the pipe would be subject to. Uh, then you could specify a concrete strength and even the required reinforcement that uh, Trig showed us uh, with the steel cages. You could use available tools like uh, this here, this Ashto chart for wheel loads and wheel spacings. Uh, you would then determine how that load is spread along the surface of a roadway relative to the direction of uh, traffic travel. Uh, you could reference the Hager pressure distribution model and you could even use the uh, Boussinesq equation to calculate pressure uh, at different depths in the soil. Um, all that would lead you to a very similar, or exactly the same, really, uh, uh, result as in using the second method, which is called the indirect design method. Uh, in this method, you could use pre-engineered designs that meet your project conditions or needs. And one common tool uh, for this uh, method is the use of ACPA published uh, fill height tables. So what you see there is just an image of the cover of um, those fill height tables that uh, most people are able to use. So um, with fill height tables, um, they make this uh, pipe strength selection simple by using a table format. So prior to using these tables, you must first know that there are some key assumptions uh, made when these tables were written. Uh, you must First, uh, verify that these assumptions would encompass your project conditions uh, prior to continuing with, with their use. Um, 
So the first assumption that we'll look at is that uh, soil has a unit weight of 120 pounds per cubic foot. Um, and just, you know, check your state as it, it would uh, change uh, from state to state. But that is the first assumption for these fill height tables. You would then determine uh, which of the four installation types for concrete uh, pipe you would be using, and we'll get into those installation types. Um, the next is that you would verify that AASHTO HL93 live load conditions would, in fact, encompass uh, your project. So in order to uh, illustrate the use of fill height tables, let's go through a quick example. So what you see on your screen there is, let's say you have a project in which you've already determined that hydraulic requirements uh, are such that you need a 24-inch internal diameter pipe. You know that the soil conditions at the job site would fall under a type 2 bedding, and we'll get into you know, what this type 2 uh, is in a little bit, and that the pipe would be buried at 16-foot depth. So as you scroll through your uh, fill height tables, um, one of the first pages you'll see is, is this one here. This detail uh, helps you identify some of the key nomenclature that will be referenced um, through those uh, tables and, and future charts. In this next page um, that you'll want to take a note of is uh, on the left side, we have table one. Uh, it's showing the four standard installation types that we uh, just previously mentioned. Um, and in general, uh, just kind of know that Type 1 is the most controlled type of installation, uh, by far the premium uh, installation for uh, rigid pipe, where Type 4 is the least controlled. Uh, and you can see there's guidelines there for bedding thickness. Uh, if you want to look at what is exactly the bedding, well, you know, you could go back to our uh, standard trench uh, detail and, and look at the nomenclature there. Um, but um, so there's requirements for the haunch and the outer bedding as well, um, and those depend on your soil category. On the right side, you can see that table two shows these uh, soil types, along with corresponding USCS and AASHTO designations. And then table three at the bottom left uh, references the deloads that we've uh, gone through with uh, uh, Trigg's explanation on, on the pipe strength. So, uh, so we're now ready to use the fill height table. So we would go to the 24-inch row for our 24-inch ID pipe and the 16-foot column, which is our buried depth. And we would arrive at a value of 1,209. So just by its color, uh, you can go over to the top right and see that in this case, we would select a class 3 pipe. So what is this 1209 value? Well, this tells us that a 24-inch ID uh, RCP pipe would be buried at, that is buried at 16-foot depth would be um, and subject to HL93 loads will experience 1209 pounds per foot diameter per, per foot of length. And so those are the values that we were looking at with Trig on on the uh, the deload machine. So we know that this is well below the 1350. Uh, for class 3 pipe, and so now we can determine that class 3 is indeed um, the right selection. So, as we saw in one of our earlier slides, additional to being a structure, the pipe must be a proper conduit, and joint performance has a major role in this function. RCP is quite versatile in that it's, uh, it's got a, several available joint types. The performance required uh, for these would be specified by the owner or by the specific project conditions. Um, and before we get into some of the joint types, let's just go through a little quick refresher on uh, standards and specifications. Uh, these are often used interchangeably and can cause some confusion. So, uh, you know, when we're talking about standards and standard specifications, we're talking about recommended guidelines uh, for a product or practice. These are, uh, you know, the ones written by organizations such as ASTM, AASHTO, ASTE. Now, when we talk about specifications or project specifications, we're talking about the written language that details that, that practice or the procedure to be followed within a certain project. Um, this can then be uh, language that gets put into a contract. 
Um, these specifications will reference standards such as those written by ASTM and ASHTO, et cetera. And uh, the project specifications, however, on, on, in this case, are written by DOTs or private engineering firms and are specific only to those projects. So for RCP, um, there are four best basic types of joint performance available. And those four are soil tight joints, hill tight joints, leak resistant joints, and then there's a special design uh, joint as well. So what are these key differences? Well, within a soil tight joint, it, it's a joint that is re, uh, resistant to infiltration of particles larger than those retained on a number 200 sieve, while the silt tight joint is resistant to infiltration of particles smaller than those passing through the two, uh, number 200 sieve. If we look at a leak resistant joint, um, it's a common, uh, commonly used joint, and while not completely leak-proof, uh, it has limits on amount of leakage. So this is the, a rate of 200 gallons per inch diameter per mile per day of, of the installed pipe. So if any of these three uh, joints uh, do not meet what you're looking for in a project, um, it would fall under the specially designed uh, joint category. And this is typically done if it's... Uh, a joint that is needed to be completely leak proof. So I think this kind of gets us uh, into our next um, audience poll. So Kim, I think we're ready for that. Um, if you could launch that, please. Sure, okay, so this one is, what type of joints are used primarily in your local market? Um, as Felix explained, they're soil tight joints, silt tight joints, leak resistant joints, or maybe you're not sure what is used in your local market. All right, we've got 75% that have voted, so I will close this one. And Felix, since you can't see this, 25% uh, said they use soil tight joints, 11% use silt tight, 39% uh, use leak resistant, and 24% aren't sure. Okay, well, that's uh, that's a pretty good spread there, but that definitely the the thirty nine percent, you know, it's the commonly used joints there with the uh, uh, leak resistance. So that's uh, it's interesting to see, and of course, that would always be, uh, you know, geographically uh, dependent. Um, but and if you don't know what you're using, no worries. That's what we are here for to look at those uh, joints exactly. So let's look at RCP joint types. So um, the joint types that uh, can provide that joint performance that we discussed, well, they are categorized as a tongue and groove or a bell and spigot. Um, the first we'll take a look at is the tongue and groove joint. Uh, so as you can see from the cross-sectional drawing, the tongue section would fit into the groove and allows for a small space in between where a butyl mastic can be placed uh, to provide that, that seal. Um, also, we could use a mortar um, for this type of joint. The next that we'll take a look at is called the single offset joint. Um, in this joint, the spigot end of the pipe has a small step in which a profiled rubber gasket can be fitted. Uh, the bell end of the pipe is then lubricated uh, for homing during installation. Uh, and the picture here shows uh, you know, the little step where the, the gasket can be placed. The next joint we'll take a look at is the confined O-ring joint. So this joint is very similar to that single offset one uh, just underneath, but it has a small groove in it where that O-ring can be placed. Uh, this groove contains the O-ring contains the O-ring from both sides, uh, and it can provide really good protection against both infiltration and exfiltration. And here we just see some of the um, standards that uh, govern these. Uh, these joints. 
So, uh, you know, another a key uh, feature of uh, RCP is its dependability. So, with that, um, I'll hand it over to Trey so he can tell us a little bit uh, about RCP's dependability. Thanks, Felix. So the first aspect of dependability that I'd like to talk about quickly is quality control. Um, one of the first keys to dependable pipe is to make sure that we have good quality control at our plants. Uh, so there's several different aspects to quality control. Uh, we could look at national standards, so ASHTO or ASTM. We could look at third party requirements, so the ACPA's QCAS program or the NPCA's program. We could look at state or local standards. Um, let's take a closer look at what ACPA provides with QCAS. So QCAS um, doesn't actually certify a single product or an entire plant, but it looks at the entire system of quality, contr quality control used at that plant. So these auditors are coming in, they're making sure that the people are trained correctly, they're performing their tests correctly, and of course they're monitoring the final product as well and the, the equipment used in that procedure. Another aspect of dependability is, uh, in my opinion, is the pipe's ability to withstand uh, natural disasters. Um, Ashto certainly has, has put a huge focus on this. The National Academy of Sciences has focused on this. And Ashto defines resilience as infrastructure's ability to prepare, plan for, absorb, recover from, or more successfully adapt to adverse events. So in other words, resilience doesn't necessarily mean that the infrastructure will sustain zero damage during an emergency event, but that it can absorb that impact and then quickly recuperate for emergency personnel or even full operation. Now, FEMA has done some research recently and they found in a recent study that for every dollar invested in disaster mitigation, uh, society saves $6 in future costs. Uh, and when they looked at flood mitigation, that number jumps up to $7 savings for every dollar spent. Um, perhaps even a, a more surprising and, and kind of scary statistic is from the Pew Charitable Trust. Uh, just a few weeks ago, they published their findings that 40 to 60% of small businesses never reopen after they are impacted by a disaster and 90% fail within a year if they aren't able to reopen within five days of that disaster. So that means that resilient infrastructure is not only important for those emergency crews, uh, for evacuation routes, but it's also absolutely critical for the life and well-being of our small businesses and our communities across the country. So let's look at an example uh, relatively recently from September of 2009. Um, in September, severe flooding hit the city of Atlanta and the surrounding counties, and, and unfortunately, it took the lives of 10 people, and it actually led to over $500 million worth of damage locally. Um, we're we're going to look specifically at Paulding and Gwinnett counties, uh, who both experienced some of this major flood damage. You can see here on the map, they're right next to each other. In Gwinnett County, a large diameter corrugated metal pipe was completely washed out left the roadway in ruins, as you can see in the photos across the top, and the replacement for that culvert was estimated somewhere in the range of 30 to 60 days. Uh, now, during that same storm in Paulding County, a little bit to the west, a twin barrel reinforced concrete pipe installation only experienced minor scour, and there was no detour required at all. Uh, just a little bit of scour of the backfill. Um, now, a couple key differences in these two projects. Uh, if you look closely at the Gwinnett project, there was no reinforcing in that headwall. And uh, it's my understanding that in the Paulding County, that headwall did have reinforcement built into it. So there were some differences in these two situations. Uh, and, and certainly two different counties may have experienced very different, different levels of flooding. Uh, but the point here is that the businesses that were located near that total washout are gonna struggle a lot. And, and certainly if that roadway is not opened up again within five to six days, they might go out of business completely. Uh, whereas any businesses or, or schools or homes that are near a culvert that can withstand that major flooding event uh, are gonna be much better off and, and hopefully only sustain minor damage. So let's, um, let's consider a solution to future-proofing infrastructure after a, a national uh, disaster has hit. So in 2011, Hurricane Irene, uh, hit the Northeast 
And just in v Vermont alone, uh, more than 2,000 culverts were damaged. Uh, one of those was a large diameter corrugated metal pipe, and it was replaced with a precast arch box on Townsend Dam Road. Uh, now, the when they replaced the washed out corrugated metal culvert, uh, FEMA felt that the precast uh, bridge structure that was used to replace it was actually an upgrade in their initial ruling. And VTRANS actually joined with the town of Townsend and they helped to defend the municipality's decision uh, through two different appeal processes that finally led to the announcement by Governor Peter Shumlin at the time uh, that FEMA would agree to fund the replacement. Now that ruling set a precedent that could allow dozens of Vermont culvert replacements to qualify for funds from FEMA. And it also raised a pretty good point. And, and that is that sometimes persistence does pay off. So they had to appeal a couple of times in order to finally get the funding to replace this structure uh, with a more resilient structure. Uh, now, Senators Leahy, Sanders, and Welch all got involved with the process as well. So it does help to have friends in high places. Uh, but after the, 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 the final round of FEMA review was completed, uh, the senators made a joint uh, statement that said, it makes no sense to use federal tax dollars to put back in place the same culverts that just blew out. So, to put it in another way, constantly replacing that failed infrastructure with the same product that previously failed is the definition of insanity. Uh, so we, we definitely applaud FEMA's final ruling on that. Now, FHWA also has provided some guidance on replacing failed infrastructure with quote unquote upgraded material. So uh, if you look at 23 CFR 667, so that's the Code of Federal Regulations uh, for Transportation, section 667, requires that each state, so each state's DOT, conduct statewide evaluations, and that starts this year in 2019, uh, to determine if there are any reasonable alternatives to roads, highways, and bridges that have required repair and reconstruction activities on two or more occasions due to emergency events. So in other words, if a culvert were to wash out two or more times and keeps getting replaced in kind, because that was the requirement originally, uh, FHWA is now saying that if you have the database to prove that it's that same culvert washing out more than once, uh, they, they want, they're encouraging the DOT to look at a quote unquote upgrade to help avoid that washout in the future. So Kim, that brings up, I think our final polling question uh, about the, the photograph here. Okay, great, thanks, Trig. So our last poll is, um, is the culvert that was just showing on the picture in Bay County, Michigan in 2017, an example of a resilient infrastructure? Choices are yes, while the roadway is destroyed, the cul culvert is still intact. Looks like it cut me off there a little bit. Or no, this road is completely destroyed and this, this situation does not demonstrate resilient infrastructure. All right, we only have about 66% who voted, so we'll give everybody just one more minute. Okay, I'm gonna close this poll. And I think this is uh, interesting results. Um, it shows 60% said yes, that while the roadway was destroyed, the culvert still demonstrates resilient infrastructure. 40% said no, the road is completely destroyed. Interesting, okay. Well, uh, what that tells me is that we need to uh, have a little bit more discussion on resilient infrastructure, which which I'm happy about. I, I am quite passionate about the, uh, about resilient infrastructure, and I'm a firm believer that our products exhibit the traits of resilient infrastructure. Uh, in this 
photograph. Um, I would argue that in, in Bay County, Michigan in 2017, yes, the roadway is, is clearly destroyed. You're not running any equipment over that. You're not being able to access uh, any emergency personnel across this crossing. Uh, but on the other hand, uh, I would argue that that pipe is still in place. It could be very easily inspected. It could be very easily backfilled and if nothing else, temporary access. So if it's an evacuation route or if we're trying to get you know, uh, fire trucks or, or any other kind of emergency crews across it, that, could, that, those temp, that temporary roadway could be opened up very quickly uh, in this situation because the, the culvert is still in place. So, so that is an interesting poll result and for those of you that said no, I would I would love to have a discussion with you about resilient infrastructure and why, you know, why I think that is an example of it and maybe why you think it isn't. All right. So, um, Trig, we, we've taken quite the journey, I think, through uh, the basics of concrete pipe. Um, and, you know, long story short, uh, I think the key bits of information that we want uh, you as the audience to, to leave here knowing are that not all pipe systems are built the same. Uh, so they should not be designed the same nor installed the same. Uh, we covered the basics, but please reach out for more information as you need it. Uh, please reach out to the ACPA and locate your nearest producing member. Uh, any of the producing members would love to host you and your company or team for a plant tour. Uh, we love showcasing what we do uh, at the plant. Uh, and then, you know, having you being able to see what we just discussed in action, very valuable. Uh, another valuable tool is seminars that ACPA offers. Uh, by getting in touch with one of the producing members, you could set up a seminar that covers a wide range of, of these topics. Uh, we have many topics that can be presented. You can pick and choose a la carte, uh, which you think are best for your team or what you want to focus on at that particular moment. Um, these seminars can be half day or full day events uh, and are fully customizable to your needs. So let's say you don't have a half day, you don't have a full day, uh, but you want to continue the learning with your, uh, with your team, uh, reach out and request a lunch and learn. You know, we can present uh, you know, on any of the, uh, the given topics, uh, show up with some lunch and, and talk to you guys about resiliency and, and look at these types of pictures and kind of discuss, uh, you know, different opinions and, and some of the uh, facts of, of RCP. Um, so if anything, it's a great way of continuing the learning and, and you get to earn your PDH credits as well. So um, with that said, uh, this was the first of a series of webinars uh, with uh, our basics being covered uh, today. Uh, be on the lookout for the next one in August, which is pipe design, and it'll go uh, much more in-depth into uh, pipe design that we briefly touched on today. Uh, October will show uh, pipe inspection and evaluation of RCP um, and buried infrastructure, I would say. Uh, December, we'll have an ethics uh, webinar, and we will see a rigid versus flexible uh, in much more detail than what we saw today in February. So. As we mentioned, just keep an eye out for those. Um, and also know that you can reach out to us at any moment. Uh, you don't have to wait for these webinars to get some information. So uh, reach out via the uh, ACPA, concretepipe.org website. Uh, and we would love to, um, uh, to answer uh, some of your questions or concerns. So with that said, I think we have uh, a few minutes for um, some questions. If uh, Kim maybe if you've received some, we can take a look at those now. Yeah, we did get a couple of great questions. Um, I will start with just the first one that came in. It said, when non-standard RCP lengths are required, do contractors typically cut the pipe to the necessary length, or do they special order specific pipe lengths? That's a, that's a pretty good question. So it is very, it's very, very common that we don't hit you know, the, the pipe runs in, in eight foot uh, increments or in some markets, they're seven and a half foot uh, joints. Um, so yes, the, the answer is that contractors can quite easily saw cut uh, to the, the length that they, uh, that they require. 
that's common practice and, and pretty easily done on site. So very good question. Okay, another question is, um, is the orientation of RCP important for drainage purposes? For instance, does the bell, oops, bell end need to face uphill in Seget and Bell RCP? Um, another good question, another good installation question. Um, typically, you'll have your bell um, uphill because um, that's the, the easiest way to install. So if you think about the bell on the, the upslope, uh, the next pipe can be very easily homed in, uh, you know, the spigot into the bell. So, uh, yes, it is. Uh, it, it greatly, um, you know, helps out with uh, installation in that regard, doing a bell end up. Good question. Yeah, and the bell end up also allows for a better entrance coefficient for your um, hydraulic calculations. And so, like as Felix said, it is most common to do a for spring year project or it done the other way. Um, it's, it's it's allowed. We just recommend uphill for the bell. Um, another great question is: Could you discuss the benefits of different manufacturing practices, such as centrif I can never say this word centrifugally spun versus vertical wet cast? Uh, I would, I'm not aware, at least, so I'm in the Northeast. I'm not aware of any producers that use centrif centrifugally spun pipe who produce it. Um, I think there might be one manufacturer on the West Coast who still uses that. Um, I think even the West Coast no longer makes that, so we really? um, okay. won't see that pipe being made anymore. Yeah, I was trying to think to myself if I know of anything in the, in the Southwest, and I, I can't think of, uh, I think it was just an extremely dangerous and outdated uh, way of, of manufacturing pipe. Um, but, uh, yeah, that I, I don't know of any. And then I would say on wet cast versus dry cast, um, it's more typical to see a wet cast in a large box than it is on pipe. Um, so almost all of our pipe is made using dry cast. It gives a very good consolidation. So even in a freeze thaw situation, you're going to have very uniform. Um, it, it almost air and trains itself. And so um, a dry cast product is very durable um, and well-made product. Great question, though. And I would add, as a manufacturer, that the dry cast process allows us as manufacturers to as uh, Trig mentioned, to reuse the, the, the jacket and core, the forms, uh, very quickly. We can strip those and, and leave them in the kiln um, versus in a wet cast process, you'd have to let the product cure in the forms. And so you're talking about more capital, more forms. Um, so it allows us to be a lot more efficient and uh, you know, in, in the production of uh, RCP when we use the, the dry cast method. Okay, great question. Um, another question we had was, what would be the benefit of pipes standing still after storms if they might not be able to flow the next storm? I'm not sure I'm clear on that question. Trig and Felix, maybe you have a better idea. Yeah, I think uh, so. I think the question there would be: Let's say you had a, let's do an extreme example. Let's say you had a thousand-year storm. It washes out your roadway. The pipe is still in position, but maybe we expect to see another storm like that. What's the advantage of having that pipe still in where it was um, if the next storm is also going to wash out the roadway? Uh, I think that's an excellent question. If I'm assuming I'm reading it correctly, um, my take on that is. Again, it comes back to that evacuation route, that, that emergency access allowance. Um, also, a, a, another great example that we didn't have time to get into today from Vermont, uh, about five years ago, there was uh, on Lowell, near Lowell, Vermont, there was a washout that washed out a, a 60 inch corrugated metal pipe. The town replaced it with an HDPE 60 inch pipe that washed out the very next year and they replaced that with a much larger box culvert. I believe it was an eight by eight box culvert. 
Uh, and the reason they kept bumping it up was not only because the road keeps washing out, but also after that plastic pipe washed out, the, the location where the pipe had been scoured down 30 feet deep. So this pipe initially only had three or four feet of cover, but because of the washout, the scour created a huge cavity. And, and actually a family driving two cars at night fell into that cavity and it was only because the the second driver acted quickly were they able to swerve and miss crushing the the car in front of them that uh that had some of their own family members in it so that's what we're trying to avoid we don't want you don't want this huge cavity to open up if the pipe stays in place uh it's it's very much less likely that something is going to scour out like that and certainly from a replacement standpoint for emergency access it's much easier to rebuild, even if it is just a temporary roadway and they decide they need to pull that pipe out and, and upsize it. At least we have that access of, of emergency personnel uh, in a relatively short period of time. Great, thanks, Trig. Um, we do have a few other questions that we'll be happy to stay on and answer. There's quite a few folks still on the call, um, but I do wanna be respectful of everyone's time. Um, so just the last, few minutes of housekeeping. Um, I did mention PDHs at the beginning of the call. When you registered, um, it did ask you for your PE number. And so as long as you put that in, um, we have that and we'll be able to process your PDH with that number on there. Um, I think if you're on a group call, um, we would need anyone that's not logged in that needs a PDH, we'll need that information that needs to be on that certificate. Um, the next Webinar, Felix mentioned earlier, and is there still on the screen, is pipe design, and that's going to be August 22nd. So we will um, probably sometime in July send out the registration for that. So you can be looking um, to register for that. And then finally, um, Felix had mentioned our fill height tables, and I wanted everyone to know they are available at no cost on our ACPA website. So if you just simply go to concretepipe.org, you can see our fill height tables. Um, pretty easily if you have trouble finding them on our website, just shoot myself or Felix or Trig an email and we can um, send you the link over. But hopefully everybody can find that and we sure appreciate everyone's attendance. Again, we'll stay on in the next couple minutes answering additional questions, but uh, look forward to everyone joining us again next time. Thanks so much.